Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here and welcome to this two hour overview course for new users to Unity on how to use the engine from the basics and the functionality all the way to coding and things like physics as well, all condensed into two hours. Let's learn how the mouse buttons work in Unity. Real simple. So as you would expect, we have three button setup we have left, middle and right. The middle being a scroll wheel. This is generally how all mouses are. So we're able to use the left mouse button to basically select anything we want as it would in pretty much any operating system we have. Now this is where it gets a little bit interesting because the right mouse button does different things depending on where we are, as you can see. So if we use the right mouse button within the scene view, we're able to pan around. You'll notice the little eye icon appears. So we're holding it down and looking around, pivoting on the spot. However, if we're in a different section of the engine, we're able to right click and get a menu. So just keep in mind that there are two functions to the right mouse button. Next thing to take a look at is the middle mouse button. If we were to select here in the middle, we can scroll, zoom in and out. If we hold down the middle mouse wheel, we can actually get the little hand tool and we're able to move our spot where we are located. Nice and simple. Easy as pie. Remember, you can combine certain aspects of the mouse. For example, we're able to drag and drop as you would expect to see in Windows or any operating system as well. So we can select something here and we can drag it anywhere we want as long as we're holding down the mouse button. So to see this in action, we could drag this onto this object right here. You just have to remember that the mouse can be used in many different ways. And here's a good example. We can scroll the mouse all the way across the scene and bring it back again. To show you how that actually works, we could change the rotation of this particular object by holding down the left mouse button and we can continually move the mouse left and you will see the mouse constantly scroll across the screen from one side to the other. And it also works in both directions, as we can see. Controlling the mouse is pretty much the same as you would expect in any other engine, for example, uh, CryEngine, Unity, as we've got right here. And it's also pretty much the same how it works within a 3D modeling engine. So guys, I hope that helps you on how to use your mouse within Unity. And I'm going to show you what different types of objects that we can have within Unity by default. So if we go to our menu up here, Game Object, we're able to select a multitude of objects. So let's stick to our 3D objects first, considering this is a 3D development engine. We can select Cube. And as you would expect, this is a simple cube. If we go to Game Object, 3D Object and Sphere, again, we have a sphere exactly what we've clicked. You're saying, Jimmy, I know this. This is just obvious. Yes, it may be. However, we can manipulate these objects to be whatever we want them to be. So a cube doesn't always have to stay as a cube. A cube could be manipulated to be an oblong, a rectangle, a wall, a floor, anything at all. As long as you rotate it in the right direction and actually change the scale of the object, it can be anything you want. Let's take this sphere, for example. We can manipulate in the transform the size going upwards and we can change it from being essentially a sphere to kind of an egg shape. So again, yes, it's a sphere, but it is also manipulatable. We can change that to be whatever we want. And if we just rotate simply on the Z, we can change this to look like that. Now it looks like a football. Well, at least American football. The sphere would actually look like a soccer ball. So let's keep that clear. So you can see how different objects can be manipulated within Unity. And it's not just spheres and cubes. There's plenty of other objects that we can deal with. If we go to a capsule, you get a similar sort of feel to what we have with the sphere. However, the capsule can be manipulated to a different degree. You can change this and get a different kind of feel. And look, we have what could essentially be a coin right there. Speaking of coins, another type of object that we could use is a cylinder. And once again, we can change how this looks. And once again, we have a bit of a coin. In its original form of one by one by one, it could be a silo, it could be a railing, it could be anything, literally anything. And if we take a look at what else we've got, there's tons of other things to look from. It's also worth noting that not every 3D object is actually something we see on screen. It's worth keeping in mind something like a wind zone 
is not something you see on scene. It's only something you see with its effects in a 3D world. So there are many different types of objects that we can have, and they include things like effects, a particle system. They include things like lights, directional light. They include so many different things. Almost everything you deal with in Unity is classed as a game object, and they can also be defined as a game object within coding. So guys, I hope that helps your understanding a little bit more of what game objects actually are and how they can be used in a scene. And let's take a look at some of the keyboard shortcuts that we can use in the Unity engine, which really help our game development and quicken things rather than going through many menus or selecting different tools. So let's say we are in the scene view right here. We can use the arrow keys to move our scene around quickly and easily. As you would expect, the up key will zoom in to whatever position we're looking at. The down key will zoom out from whatever position we are. Left would take us left and right would take us right. Arrow keys, they are absolutely essential in the scene view. The next handy one that we can take a look at is the F key. Let's zoom all the way out and let's have this cube selected. Now let's press the F key. We'll be able to focus on whatever object we have selected. So if we have the camera selected here, press F, we'll be able to center on that. Back to our cube. Now another way of looking at this is going to the hierarchy. So if we have this selected, and let's imagine there are many, many more objects within the hierarchy right here, we can also press F and it will highlight yellow whatever object we currently have selected. It's just a handy little tool that we can use when we really get into deep development and we have a lot of objects within the scene. So another handy one to use is recreating this object or duplicating. And we can do that by making sure we have the object selected right here and then hold control and press D and this will literally create a duplicate of that object and it makes things a lot easier in the long run because rather than use the control C control V which you can do in unity control C control V you can see we've created a duplicate that way however it is much more easier to use the control D function to duplicate any object and you can go on and on and on with this Another one, obviously, but I'm going to cover it anyway, is delete. Get rid of an object. What more can I say? Now, a handy little shortcut that people don't realize is actually in Unity, rather than have to go to our menus to get an empty game object, we can always hold down Control, hold down Shift, and press N. And that will create an empty game object. And empty game objects can be used for absolutely anything. Some more handy keyboard shortcuts that we can get to grips with are all these tools here. If we were to hold uh, press Q, we can get the hand tool so we can pan around nice and easy. Press W, we get the move and we can do whatever we want. Next, if we press E, you can see where this is going. We've got the rotate so we can rotate an object and whatever else we need to as long as it's selected. And next we have the R, which is, yep, scale the next one along as you would expect and the last one that i'm actually going to deal with at this point is the rec tool and we can press t to do that now there is a different tutorial where we can explore what these are all for however these are just the keyboard shortcuts that you're most likely to use there are many many more but these are the ones you'll use more than anything else when developing in unity hey guys jimmy vegas here and let's take a look at the transform component so what exactly is the transform component? Well, in simple terms, it's a way of determining and modifying an object's position, rotation, and size. Every object will have this in Unity. So if we take this skull right here that I have in the scene, over here in the inspector panel, we can see this thing called transform. And this is the transform component. And as I said, it dictates the position, the rotation, and the scale of any object in Unity. So Ideally, every object, at least in a 3D environment, should be based upon an X, Y, and Z coordinates, as we can see dictated by these three lines right here. So if we were, for example, to change the position of this skull on the X, which is across, as we can see here, we could manually type the position right here. So let's type 14, and we can see it's moved that way. But you'll notice as we press 1 to go to 14, it will automatically move to one before we type four 
for 14. Another way of changing this is hovering your mouse over the X and you can see highlight blue. And then if you hold down the left mouse button, you can move the position of the skull quite easily. And this applies to every single aspect. So Y and Z as well, forwards and backwards. And you can always still type no problem. So they're the two ways that you can change. And it's the same for the rotation as well. We can change rotation on X, same with the Y, and same with the Z. It's as easy as that. And finally, the size, which is the scale. So size and scale are the same sort of thing within Unity. In this case, we can change it to two by two by two. So keeping everything relative makes the skull look how it should do, but two times bigger. However, if we were to change the scale to four by one by four, it would look massively distorted. So ideally, you need to keep the scale relative to the actual size of the object. But you can still do the same. And you can see you're having a massive weird thing going on there. And you can easily reset everything by zeroing everything out back to its original size, except the scale, because you can see the scale here. If we have zero, it basically disappears because zero means that there is no size at all. Reset it to one by one by one, and then you have your skull or whatever object you have back to its normal size. So it's kind of easy to keep track of the basic attributes of any object using this transform. And always remember to see the transform, we just click here on an object, or we can click it in the scene, and it'll usually be this first component within the inspector panel. Easy as that. Let's take a look at what the inspector panel is for. So the inspector panel is where all components of objects within Unity here in your scene are stored. So a component is a way of containing information about a specific object. For example, how it looks, whether you can walk through it or not, whether it can animate or even scripts. So it has many, many components, but not all objects will be relative to the same component. For example, if we have a cube, which is just going to be a trigger, for example, then that will have quite the same components as what this bed that we have in our scene does. And the same applies to this directional light right here. So let's start with the directional light. And we can see here that we have the default transform component, which we already know about, hopefully. The next one down is a light component. So we can add multiple components to one single object, even if they're not necessarily relative to that object. We would just need to click add component right here and you would end up with a list like this. And we can select the different type of component we're looking for. So, for example, if we wanted our light to contain a collider in whatever way, we could go to physics and select one of the colliders if we wanted to. Now, it would be a little bit silly to attach a collider to a light. No point. However, we could also go back and if we didn't really know where things were located, we could actually search for a specific component. For example, animation or animator. So we can type it here and it will search as you type whatever you're looking for. So you'll see this is how a component looks and it's dictated by this little arrow here and we can collapse it up and it just becomes nice and easy to see. And as I said earlier, each component is going to be different to each object. For example, if we take this bed, there is no component other than a transform attached to this bed. The reason being is that this object of bed is an empty game object and it contains two other objects. So let's take this mattress right here. This specific object contains quite a few components. The first one obviously being transform. The second one is the mesh, and the mesh is just basically to make it look what it is, and the same with the mesh renderer. That's obviously what it is. It does exactly what it says there. It renders the mesh, which hence the reason why we have the material right here. Now, the material is a slightly different style of component, as we can see, because anything that has something attached to it visually should have a material. But we could always attach something else here. So add component. And let's go to physics and let's tick or let's go for box collider. And you can see we've just added that component. So adding components is as simple as just doing all these various things. And we could add a rigid body if we wanted to. Probably not necessary in this case, but we can still add that. So components are as simple as that. And you can also drag and drop, for example, a script 
onto this object here and that would create its own component. Alternatively, you'll be able to click add component and you can also create a new script and do it that way by adding a component. If your inspector panel looks a little bit odd, not quite how you would expect it to look in this case, it may be that you've accidentally entered debug. To get out of that, you would just click this menu up here and you can see that we have debug and normal right here. If we click on debug, you can see it does look a little bit different. This contains a little bit more information than what the standard inspector panel does for each component. However, it's not entirely necessary to be in this look. So most people would stick to normal. So again, if it does look a little bit different, your inspector panel, it's because you may be in debug mode. So remember, if you want any information on an object, you'll always find it within the inspector panel and within its certain component. So quickly reiterating once again, if we wanted some effects like a halo or lens flare, again, he is not really necessary on this mattress, but you would be able to add in those specific components. And remember, components are what make objects work. And let's take a look at the file menu and build settings. So the file menu, as you would expect to find, is pretty self-explanatory. New scene, open scene, save scene, save scene as, new project, open project, save project. These are all relatively simple and we should understand them quite simply. The two which we're going to take a look at specifically are these two right here, the build settings and build and run. So if we go to the build settings right here, you'll be presented with this little window. And this little window may seem daunting and confusing at first. However, it's not as complicated as you would think. So this section at the top, scenes in build, this represents the scenes within Unity. And by default, scene zero will always be the first scene to load. When we add more scenes here, they'll be given a specific unique number. So the next one will be one, then two, then three, then four. And it makes it easy to reference these scenes in coding. And you can easily add scenes just by clicking add open scenes. Now, if I click it now, it won't do anything because I'm already in this sample scene here and it's already added. If we did have another scene, we would just click add open scenes and it would add it and give it its unique number. The platform section right here, this dictates what platform you are building for. By default, it's going to be PC, Mac and Linux standalone. This means it will develop or create an executable file when we build the game. If you want to develop for iOS, Android, whatever, you can. All you would need to do is click on switch platform. Key thing to note here, the sooner you switch platform, basically, if your project becomes too big, it may take longer than you would expect. If you switch platform right at the beginning, it'll do it in no time at all. It's pretty good like that. Also, as we go down the list, you'll see Xbox One, PS Vita, PS4. It's worth noting, especially for the PlayStation ones, that you would need a specific um, installation which requires a license. As it says, it gives you a little bit of information. Your license does not cover PS4 publishing. You need to upgrade. However, it's up to you whether you want to, but generally most people would want to develop for mobile games or PC. So it's worth, you know, remembering that I would say uh, and as as always if you've started Android and want to port to PC you just click on the switch platform but it is definitely vital to do it sooner rather than later but you can do it even when you've got a complete massive game you can still do it don't ever worry about that obviously we have the target platform that's specific to the PC because if we go to iOS it's not there Android it's not there it's just because these two are combined together PC Mac and Linux Obviously, Mac isn't there because I'm not using a Mac. I'm using Windows, so that's the reason why it's not there. Architecture, pretty self-explanatory. Everything else, as you would expect. Development build is a key one. If you want this to be a development build, i.e. a watermark on there just to say development build, then you would tick that. So clicking build or build and run first time will prompt you to save your actual game. So you can see you can save it there. After that, you'll be able to just click build, or if we go back to our file menu, you'll be able to click build and run, and it would do it straight away. So it's just a case of getting used to this little window, but this is the vital one of where you build and run your game. So 
guys, I hope that's helped you and helped you uh, understand what this build settings is really for. It's quite important, I would say. Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here, and let's take a look at cameras. So what is a camera exactly and how does it work in Unity? Well, put simply, it is a way of rendering our game and outputting via this camera. So basically, what the camera sees is also what the player sees. And you can swap cameras in and out, change them and modify them in many different ways. By default, you will have the main camera right here. And you also get this little camera preview down here. So if we were to press play, what the camera sees is what we would see right here despite the fact we are looking at this in the scene view. Now, if we go back to our game, we can see absolutely nothing. However, if we press play, and we can then change this camera, and it works in the same way as pretty much any other object, we can move it around our scene, bring it closer, bring it further away, rotate, and basically you just need to align your camera and bring it into a position where you can see. And you can see what I'm doing here, I'm pivoting around the scene and getting into a place where the camera will be relative and can see something. Now you'll notice at this point, nothing is still seen in here. Cameras can be a little bit tricky sometimes to work with. Good way of getting around this is if we drag this main camera onto the skull right here, we can zero out the position of the camera and then pull that camera outwards and upwards. It's also worth noting that the camera is sensitive to many different factors, i.e. lighting within Unity. So if we were to go to Window, Rendering, Light Settings, and change the skybox back to something normal, we would be able to see exactly what's going on. So let's press play, and we can see how this camera is now rendering. And the reason the mattress has fallen there is just because of gravity. But I'm just going to turn that off just for the purposes of this video by removing that component. Speaking of components, the camera component obviously is attached to the camera and this contains many things. By default, it's pretty standard and pretty decent to deal with. The one thing you may want to change is the field of view. And if we change this field of view here, you'll see it change in this camera preview. It's kind of like a zooming thing. But again, it's up to you. So let's see how we can swap cameras in and out to create a different effect. So if we go, go uh, I can't get my words out there. If we go to game object and then go down to camera, it will add a brand new camera to the scene with a brand new camera preview. So I'm going to bring this camera over this way, bring it to here, and I'm going to leave it there. And then I'm going to press play. Now you'll notice the camera which renders is this one that we've added in. So whatever is the latest camera will be the one that renders. So I'm going to bring these two cameras next to each other and then I'm going to press play. So what we can do is we could turn off this camera by ticking this little box up here and it would automatically switch to the next active camera. In this case, main camera. So you can see just by changing like that, we can change the camera angle relatively easily. And you can actually change the camera during the game. So if we turn this camera off, go to our main camera, we could rotate our camera in game. However, just like any other object, when you change it in game and press the play button to stop, it changes back to what it initially should be. So multiple cams can be used in one scene and you can use codes to switch between the two. Basically what we did when we were turning it on and off, that was basically all you need to do in the code you can turn the cameras off and you can add animations to cameras. You can add effects to cameras like post processing. You can really customize a camera, but they are absolutely essential and vital in any game in Unity, not just 3D games, but 2D as well. Because as I said earlier, whatever the camera sees is what is projected and rendered so the player can see it too. It basically is a way of feeding onto your screen. And like I say, you can have many, many cameras all doing different things. So just one quick last example, I'm going to change this camera to there, and then I'm going to hold control, press D to duplicate once again, and then I'm gonna bring this camera over here and then just make it look this way. So now we have three cameras in our scene. There we go. So we can turn the cameras on and off, modify, change, do whatever we want.
See? Change it like that. The last thing I'm going to talk about is this. You may get this error, no cameras rendering, if all cameras are off. And what that essentially means is exactly what it says. There are no cameras that can render anything in the scene. And if we were to change anything, for example, the skull, you wouldn't see it rendering at all. You just wouldn't see anything at all until you turn the camera back on. And we can see there the effects have changed. Even though they would have changed in scene view, they won't change in the game view because the camera isn't rendering. So we can turn that off and you get the same error. So if you ever have this error, you just need to make sure that at least one of your cameras is rendering. Basically, is it turned on? Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here, and let's take a look at materials and textures. So within Unity, the way you can actually make an object look like something is by applying a material to it and then applying a texture to that material. It's worth pointing out that a texture does not get applied directly to an actual object. It has to go through that phase of going to a material and then going to the object. But that's not to say that you can't drag and drop a texture onto an object because you can. And that is the first way of creating a material. So if we take this texture and bring it onto this object, you would basically have that texture on this object. However, if we were to click on that object, you would see down here in the inspector panel, the material. And that material is created in this folder right here. So when we apply a texture to an object, it automatically creates its own material within this folder right here, or any subfolders that you may have textures further down. So how do we use this material? Well, let's take a look at what we can and can't do. We can either play around with it here in the inspector panel, or we can click the material itself and play around with it directly here. So the albedo right here, this is the main part. This is what dictates whatever texture is attached to the material, which then feeds onto a game object. We can also change the kind of tint of the game object as well. As we can see here, by default, white means it's original color, but we can tint it, let's say, a greenish kind of color by just doing that. It's as simple as that. So the next thing that you would want to take a look at is the metallic. If we move the slider, we can see just how much that changes. And depending on your game world, you would want it to be really metallic or not very metallic at all. And the same applies for the smoothness. These two you can play around with quite a bit to get a different effect. The next one down is changing the source. So you can either change the albedo alpha or metallic alpha. You see, you won't be able to see much of a difference, at least with a simple object, but you would see it more within more quality objects, we could say. But in simple development, that's not going to matter too much. I generally like to have it as albedo alpha. I feel like that gives me a little more control. Normal map is something we'll also deal with quite a bit because normal map allows you to have some bumps or it looks like bumps with on the object. So it gives it a bit more of a 3D look rather than the flat look that it has right now. So to create a normal map, you would take your original texture. Thank you, malware bytes. And you would hold control and press D to duplicate it. So create a new one. And up here in the texture type, you can change that to a normal map. And you can either click create from grayscale or not. We'll use both right now just to show you how it looks. So let's click on apply. And we've then created right here a normal map, as simple as that. So if we click on this object now, and let's edit this in the inspector panel on the actual object, we can drag and drop this normal map right here. And you should notice a change. See how it looks now? It looks completely different, but we can also change the intensity of that normal map right here just by moving across easy so you can manually set this number or you can hover your mouse here to change let's set it back to one let's click on the normal map again and then let's click on create from grayscale and this will change in real time when we press apply so you can see it gives you a different kind of look and this look definitely gives you more of a feeling of there's actually a bit more depth to this object rather than it just being flat and that is evident just by looking at it right now but you can still apply that change there in the normal map looks a little bit crazy probably not the best thing to do but maybe one isn't quite right and you might want to reduce it slightly so you could have 0.5 
just to give it a little bit of texture but you can see how this is applied nicely now all the others won't really matter too much within this because it's not massively important to understand what a lot of the things do here things like height map height map is a way essentially another way of making it look three-dimensional rather than that 2d flat kind of thing and things like tiling you can dictate how many times you want it to repeat on each face of the object and generally you can play around with a lot of these settings and you know see what you can come up with things like shader as well you can change the shader for example to particles and go additive and you will see what kind of effect it has shaders are something which are again vital in materials and you can get a lot of custom shaders but generally for at least simple game development there is a lot of things that you can play around with to make them look kind of cool and you can see how this looks now we've made it look a little bit like a box nice and simple but again it, it's all about how you want to create your own game and how you want to deal with your own objects i would recommend playing around with the materials as much as possible but there is another way to create a material we don't necessarily have to drag and drop every time we can right click create and guess what we have it right there material and it's created the exact same way so instead of the albedo being already there we would just need to drag and drop the albedo straight onto there and yeah you can just drag the material onto a game object like so so that is how materials work that's the flow that you use to go from a texture to a material to a game object and that is basically how it's done remember textures aren't applied directly to uh, the object it's always the material that covers the object so guys i hope that helps a little bit when it comes to texturing and materials and we're going to explore the snap settings so what are snap settings well easiest way to explain is a way of moving objects around the scene in certain movements for example if we would take this cube and just hold our left mouse button and move we can see in the transform over here how it changes so it's a massively intricate kind of affair going on here and we can see the numbers change quite drastically what snap will do is allow you to move this object in any direction in a specified amount so if i set this back to where it should be at zero 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 i can hold control and then i can move this object on the same axis and you'll see it snap into position so I currently have it set to move at half each time. So you'll see this go from 1.5 to 2. So how do we access these snap settings? Well, if we go to edit and down the bottom, the three numbers you're going to be most concerned with is this move X, move Y, move Z. Now you can set these as very intricate numbers. So two decimal places. However, I would always recommend setting them to something either whole or half. So we have, for example, one by one by one. And if we close that, we can then move this cube one at a time. So you'll see this number change to one. There we go, and now zero. And now what we can do, because we've done that, is we can snap these two cubes together and it technically makes them look like one object because they're flush against each other. So holding control and bringing together, there we go. We have these two objects together. And going back to snap settings, I did say you can have it as a whole number or half number. I would recommend. It's entirely up to you what you want to snap them together as, but as I say, that's my recommendation. You could, if you wanted to, have a quarter as well. So 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. It would then allow you to move the cube at a quarter each time. So four movements of this way, holding control, will bring this to zero. So one two three four the snap settings are vital in a lot of games because they really help you bring objects flush against each other and kind of eliminate that seamless effect the where you can slightly see through a wall or something because they're not flush together that is what snap settings are extremely helpful for so I would recommend them to anyone. They're easy to use. It's just all about holding control and then moving in any direction, as we can see, not just on the Z. So if we set it back to same as I had it when I started, 
5.5.5.5. It's as simple as that. And then we can move like so. Easy. So guys, I hope snap settings are something that will be useful for you. I hope you use them. And if you want to know any more, leave a comment below. Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here, and let's talk about the hierarchy. So what is the hierarchy exactly? Well, it's a vital piece of unity, and essentially it is a way for us to see whatever is in this scene right here in a text format. And we're able to use that hierarchy to manipulate, control, select, and change objects real time within our scene or even our game view However, when we're in our game view, they revert back to normal status when you come back to scene view. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Now, every object here has its own individual name. Some can actually be duplicated. For example, we now have two objects called cube. That's probably not good practice. So it is always wise to have things named, you know, at least uniquely. Uh, so, to change something in Hierarchy, we could literally right-click and we could change its name just by clicking Rename. Or we could duplicate, like so. And then, that reacts and it's visible in the scene view. So, something else to note within the Hierarchy is something called Parent and Child. And what that is, is a way of displaying which objects are coupled together. And that's dictated by an arrow. So, if we wanted to attach all these blocks together, we could take all these extra cubes that we've created by holding control and clicking on them in the hierarchy. And then we can drag and drop them into this object in the hierarchy. And you can see it's selected by the light blue. And now we have that arrow. That arrow means that all those objects are now a child object of this cube. So they all fit together nicely and they can be moved all together just by having this one object in the hierarchy selected. So there's a way of also creating objects within the hierarchy, clicking right here, and you can create absolutely anything you want that you normally would see. So you've got a cylinder, real easy. And again, right click and you can still create. So like I say, the main purpose of the hierarchy is to see visually or textually, if that's a word, what is in the scene. And it helps a lot, especially when you're dragging and dropping, you know you need to drag for example, a texture onto an object, but you can't quite see it in the scene. You can find it in the hierarchy and drag and drop straight there. No problem. And that is the beauty of how the hierarchy works. A lot of people get a little bit confused to how it is. In fact, some people probably don't use the hierarchy as much as they should, but it is a vital piece of unity. So guys, I hope that's cleared up the hierarchy just a little bit. Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here, and let's take a look at some simple animations and how we can animate objects in Unity. So what we really need to do is have a specific tab called the Animation tab. And we can get this by clicking anywhere in one of these little menus. So you could have it here if you wanted. You could have it here if you wanted, but I generally like to have it here at the bottom. So we click the little menu here, click on Add tab, and then click on Animation. It will bring this up. Now, in its simplest form, animation is incredibly easy to do. So we could do something like uh, change the position, the rotation, the size, the alpha, all kinds of different things. So let's take this object right here. So we need to make sure we have an object selected. As it says here, no animatable object selected. So let's select this one right here. It gives us the option to create an animation. So let's do so. And we can call this absolutely anything we want. Let's call it my anim and save and you'll be presented with something like this if you're using a very old version of unity the record button right here may already be selected if not you just need to press this right here we're doing this in 60 frames a second and we can see that dictated here by samples this right here is our frame number frame zero is our very first keyframe so we would want to set the keyframe of what this is right here as it is. So let's rotate this constantly. So what we could do is let's take a look at the rotation here and let's rotate on the Y. So we want to make sure the Y axis in its first keyframe is set as zero. And to do that, we would go up here to our transform component. We could type one or two or three or whatever, but then set it back to zero. And you can see that this is now red. This means a frame is being set. So we have that keyframe set. Now let's say we want to rotate by 90 degrees 
by the time we get to the 60th frame, which is one second. So we could go here and type in six zero, hit return, and it would take us to the 60th frame. You can see here, the white line is now at the 60th frame. So we could then set this to 90. And what that means is that during the course of zero frames and 60 frames, it will rotate 90 degrees and it will animate itself. You don't need to set each frame. It will do it automatically. So it just has to move from this frame to this frame and it knows how to get it there. So let's say by the 180th frame, hit return, we want it to rotate to, I don't know, 180. So it rotates quickly, then slowly. And then let's have it rotate really fast. So let's say by frame, what should we have? 210, we've rotated to 270. And then let's say another second, so 270, and it rotates back to zero. However, we would want to set this as 360. Hit return. So it's rotated 360 degrees. Now, what should happen if we press the record button? It will stop that animation. And that animation is now saved. So if we go to our project, we can see that two files have been created. The one with the play icon, that is the animation itself. The other one is called a controller. The controller holds all the animations that you create for one specific object. So if we click on the object itself, we can see here it has the animator component and the controller is right there. And that houses all of these animations. So if we bring our camera, well, we should be able to see it because we can see it in our preview right there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this camera onto cube four, zero it out and then drag the camera back out and then reposition it so we can see the animation in action. So let's press play and we should see that animation work no problem. Awesome. So that's how we can control animations, but there's different things you could do. You can mix and match animations. So we've clicked an animation and it's disappeared. That's because we're not set on the right object. So let's click on our object. And now let's change the scale. So because we're making modifications in this animation, we can click on the record button to go back into edit mode. And let's say we want the scale to be one by one by one when we start. So let's change to zero, 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 and then just reset to one, one, one. Remember, this is the first keyframe. We're setting its original position and we need this to be read to show that it's, it's set. So let's go to frame 60. And let's say by frame 60, we want it to be half the size. So let's set it to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5. Now let's go to frame 180, which is this one right here. And let's say we want to make it double size. So 2 by 2 by 2. And now let's go to frame 210, which is the next frame. And you can see all these frames up here are set because all the options here are turned red. So let's bring it back to one by one by one. And we'll keep it as one that whole time. So let's press the record button to save that animation. And now when we press play, we should see that updated animation. Awesome. So you can see how the animations can work nice and easily. And it's not just objects that you can animate, you can animate anything. You could animate a camera, you could animate a light, you can animate a particle system, absolutely anything. It just depends what you want to do with an object. And you can see how this is reacting. It's kind of cool now, but it's an endless animation. Last thing to take a look at is the animation itself. We could always untick loop time so as it only plays the once. This is handy for things like attacking animation. And there we go. It's just played once. And let's take a look how we can import assets real easy into Unity. So the basic idea of importing assets has always been the whole drag and drop thing. We could literally take anything, drag and drop into Unity. Now there is one drawback to this. You may not be able to do it with certain assets. Why? Because they're in a zipped folder. Now it's worth definitely pointing out that you cannot drag and drop 
anything from a zipped folder into Unity. You have to unzip it first. So let's go into that folder we have just imported and it is literally a case of now dragging and dropping into our scene. It, it's literally as simple as that to import assets into Unity. As we can see, we've just brought in this axe. No problem whatsoever. So it's basically the same with anything, whether it's textures, whether it's objects, whether it's uh, scripts even, you know, anything at all, you just drag and drop into this section down here in Unity. And if you've put it in the wrong place by mistake, you can always use that old drag and drop to just drag and drop something into its correct folder. As simple as that. The other way to import assets is through the Asset Store. And I've covered the Asset Store in different videos, and it's something I definitely would uh, recommend exploring. And you can see, but generally, this is not the whole drag and drop. This is searching for an asset and then clicking Import. It really is as simple as that. So if we search for a skybox, for example, it is a case of going to that actual asset and then you click download or import, depending if you've bought the asset before. But that's how you would import it from the asset store. External assets, drag and drop down here in your project window. Easy, simple, convenient, perfect. And that's what you need in Unity. And let's talk about scenes. So what exactly is a scene in Unity? Well, best way to describe it is what we see here, literally in the scene view. Now we have to remember a scene and the scene view are two separate things. However, the scene view is where we're able to see what we're building in that scene. So the scene itself is dictated by this little icon here and it is classed as an asset. So we're able to see any scene just by clicking this asset and you can see already I have this sample scene here and obviously you can save scenes, load scenes. Remember all this kind of thing is in the file menu and obviously new scene would generate a brand new scene. You're able to save the scenes. I know I've said scenes a lot but generally in the older versions of Unity you would save your scenes in the default assets window. In the newer versions of Unity, i.e. 2018 onwards, you save them in a specific folder here called scenes. The main thing to remember is that it's an asset. It's always going to be an asset. So even if you create an entire scene, it's still going to be an asset. Think of it as like a prefab, a top level prefab. And that contains every sub item. Obviously here we'd see them, in the hierarchy, but like I say, it's a prefab that contains everything else, including your scripts. That's the best way of looking at it. And you build anything in the scenes, whether it's 3D or whether it's 2D. So they are vital to development. So guys, I hope that clears up what exactly a scene is and how we use them. And remember, click on the subscribe button, click on the bell icon as well, and you can stay up to date with everything I have on this channel because there is so much content for you guys to learn. Let's take a look at the input settings. So the two big questions we need to ask are what are the input settings and where are the input settings? Well if we go to edit and down here we go to project settings and we can click on input. So what are these input settings? These input settings are a way of Unity understanding what key we're pressing, what button we're clicking, what our mouse movement is, all that kind of thing. For example, if we go to this one right here, Fire 1, we can click it and it gives us a lot of options. So the name should really be unique, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If there are multiple buttons that you could press, more than two for example, then you could have the same one duplicated further down as it is here. In this case, the positive button would be left control key on the keyboard or the mouse zero. And mouse zero is actually the left mouse button. So if we change and have a look at something like submit, we can see here that in this case, we just have return and we just have joystick button zero. So return, obviously the enter key, that would be submitting something. When we come to something like, let's go to horizontal, we have left, right, A, D. So the positive button is right. So we want to move right. So we go that way and we press the right key. Or if you're using WASD, you would use the D key. So that's the positive button to go right. The negative would be A or left, and that would take you left. So there's no point in having four different directions when you can just use horizontal and vertical. Same principle applies to them, up and down, 
S and W. So I'm going to collapse all those up now. And you can actually add your own if you wanted to. For example, if we wanted to set up something for the E key, we could go up here, add one to our size, and it would duplicate whatever is last in that list. And speaking of whichever one is last, it's cancel. And we all know cancel, escape, as simple as that. At this point, when we've created the new input, we would just need to name it, for example, E key. And the positive button would be E. We wouldn't need any other positive buttons and we wouldn't need any negative buttons because there's going to be no alternative. It's just the E key. That's all there is to it. Things like the dead zone and the sensitivity relate to mouse movement. And you can change the type down here to mouse movement if you wanted to. So, for example, if we go to mouse X, we can see that that is based on the X axis of the mouse. So, i.e. moving it this way. And the same will apply for the mouse Y and same will apply for mouse scroll wheel. So, like I say, you can add your own input settings here to kind of customize your own game. It's up to you how you want to deal with it. You can have one for the R key, T, Y, G, J, B, whatever. You know, it's, it's entirely up to you and you can do it all here in the input settings. And you just have to remember that these input settings are what Unity uses to register what you are doing with your hands, basically. And we're going to take a look at a couple of options on the toolbar. So the toolbar is dictated by pretty much this at the top of the screen. Now, I'm not going to go into absolutely everything because generally not everything is required for absolute beginners, but you will come to understand these naturally as you go through. So firstly, we have the hand tool and the hand tool is a way of changing what we can see in the scene so we can move things around easily within the scene. This isn't the way you select objects within the scene. It also doesn't stop you looking around like so. You'll notice that as I hold the right mouse button down in the toolbar, that icon turns to the eye and then turns back to the hand whenever I deselect. The next one along right here is the move tool. And this is the way you can select objects within your scene to move around. It's nice and easy, but it still doesn't stop you with that right click. Next one here is the rotate tool. And yep, you guessed it. This is how you can quickly and easily rotate objects within Unity. Nice and simple. Instead of having to change things all the time, it's up to you whether you want to use the keyboard shortcuts, but sometimes it's nice and easy to use these things. Here we have the scale tool, and yep, you've guessed it, you can change the scale of any object. So now this axe looks pretty crazy because we're changing the scale nice and easily. And you can tell when you're in the scale view because you can see these little cubes at the end of the axes. Simple. The next one we have is the rec tool. Now, I specifically use the rec tool for UI more than anything, not specifically game objects, but you can kind of change the shape and everything, at least in a 2D environment, nice and simply. In a 3D environment, you can only change it on two axis. It's a bit difficult to change it on three axis, but either way, you can still use it. And this one is basically just a combination of everything together, just to make things a little bit easier. If you're trying to get something very refined, you can just use this little one here, which is the combination. Then you have things like, if you hover over it, it also gives you little, uh, you know, hints of what you can do. But these things aren't 100% necessary. It's up to you how you want to change them. You know, you've got your global and your local. Global is always going to be, well, the world. Local is always close here. Uh, you've got your cloud settings, you've got your account, and you've got your layers, everything here. Layers are something that you can deal with in other ways, uh, right here in the inspector panel. And layout, you can select your layout, whatever you want. And account, obviously, what you want to log in with. And let's talk about lighting. So in Unity, there are many different types of lighting. And depending on what scenario or scene you're trying to create, different type of lighting may be required. The most basic type of lighting that we have, or the default one that we have, is this directional light. And what directional light does is it will illuminate the entire scene in the given color that you have. So you could literally change the color to a kind of red color. And you can see the tint here changes it to red. Changing the rotation as well also changes how the light looks. If you have very minimal rotation, you're not going to get much light, as you can see right here. You get a dark, eerie kind of look. However, full light, you can see right here, that red 
can be changed to yellow, it can change to blue. You've always got that tint in the direction of light. And as I say, this one illuminates the entire scene. So I'm going to turn that one off. And then I'm going to go to game object, light, and then let's try point light. Point light illuminates a given area. For example, if we double click point light here, you can see it's surrounded by this yellow sphere. This yellow sphere is dictated by the range, which can be set right here. And we, if we set this to 20, you'll see it doubles in size. Obviously, the higher the range, the further this light will reach. The intensity is also important in any lighting, really, because if we have this as high intensity, you can see just how it changes here. Lighting also helps with making the quality of a scene better, but getting the right light is always important. So it's important to know what type of light you need for your scene. So if I set this back to, let's say, 2, and then zoom in, we can see how this is having an impact on the scene. So if we move it over here, we can see the light moves with wherever we have, as long as it's within this range. And obviously the further away we get, the dimmer it would get on any given object. And the closer, you can see just how much it illuminates this, as opposed to everywhere else. So the next light that we can take a look at is Spotlight. Spotlight is exactly what it is. If we take it out, we can see how much of an impact this has on this area. You can see it illuminating very slightly here. However, we can change the range to be quite high and also change the intensity quite high and you can see how it illuminates an actual spot, a given area. This can also be changed in colour like we've done previously, so it's up to you what you want to deal with there. You can see how it changes. And once again, the range can be changed. The spot angle is what makes this a little bit different because you can change how the spot angle is all the way from 1 to 179. So if you want a very refined spot, you could have it just so. So with lighting, they are the three that you would probably experience more than anything. Area lighting is something a little different because generally it's something that isn't necessarily used in the same way that uh, we would use the other three. This is more for baked lighting and baked lighting is something where we can Think of it as a way of predicting what the lighting is going to be, and we can set that rather than render in real time. It's not something I really deal with too much because I prefer the other types of lighting as we can see. The last thing I want to touch on is reflection and light probe. Now, something like a reflection probe is quite useful because it gives a bit more reflection and depth to a game, but it's not something a lot of people do use within Unity, and I guess you know, for good reason, because it depends on what style of game they want to aim for. And you can see here changing the intensity is quite drastic. Lighting is something that people spend, you know, hours, days, weeks, months perfecting in a game before they're even happy because lighting makes or breaks a game sometimes. Also worth noting that if we have all these lights on at once, it's probably not a good idea. Having too many light sources in a game may slow down your uh, gaming experience, especially if they're all done in real time right here. If we were to do it baked, then that's a little different. Uh, I'm going to quickly touch on shadows because you can set shadows. Obviously, things in the normal world do have shadows. You can either have hard or soft shadows. In minor game development, it doesn't really matter too much, but I generally like to go for soft shadows. I feel it just adds a little bit more depth than a hard shadow would. You're not going to see too much of an impact here just because of the amount that I have in the scene is not a lot, but we should be able to see if I move that up and down, we do have shadows roughly around here. So I would uh, recommend experimenting with lighting more than anything, seeing what you can come up with and seeing how different types of light these three that we've discussed mainly, how these three different types of light will reflect your scene and how each one of them may make the scene look different. So guys, I hope that's helped a little bit with lighting. I know it can be tough and there is a lot more to it than what I've covered here. But once you've got these basics down, you can just kind of run with it and really experiment and go mad with it. And let's take a look at some C-sharp coding. So there is this kind of perception in video game development that coding is incredibly difficult. And I personally don't think it is because it's all about understanding the logic and flow of the code. If you take the time to actually think about what you're coding, how you can put it together, build small, then build big, 
it makes so much more sense. So to create a script, it's as simple as right clicking, create and C sharp script. And it's important what we call this script. We have to make a note of what we call it just in case we need to change anything in the future. I'm going to call this JV script. Nice and simple. And then we'll open it up in a program called Visual Studio. Now you can use Mono Develop if you have that or any other editing software. Usually I like to go for Visual Studio because it's simple and straight to the point. Now remember I said earlier we have to remember the name of the script. Here we have the public class as JV script. The class has to be the exact same as the script name itself. It has to be otherwise the script will not work. So keeping that in mind, we've skipped ahead because we've missed three lines of code up here. What are these up here? These up here are the namespace. This is where we can declare within the script certain items, we could call them, that the script would need to use. For example, if we were dealing with AI elements, we would need to have uh, using Unity Engine.ai. If we were using um, GUI elements, we'd have using unity engine.ui. It's just a way of the script recognizing where it needs to pull information from for the public class. So as I said, the public class, this is where all of our actions happen, where we declare things and where we code. So everything we write is usually going to be within this public class. These things here are called methods. So void start, void update, these are methods. And this is where all the actions are performed within the script. So if you need the script to do something, they're done within a method. These right here are annotations, these green lines. These aren't lines of code which are executed. These are just notes, a way of making quick and simple notes of what different things do. These, the parentheses here, open close bracket, these are used to contain information. For example, if we need to have an extra variable, as it were, like a collider, for example, then we would have it in here, which references inside that method. Speaking of variables, we can declare variables after the public class up here or within inside the method. It doesn't really matter too much, but if you declare a variable inside the method, only that method could use it. So if we had a variable inside void start, we couldn't use it inside void update. We'd have to have it inside the public class. Curly brackets, these are what contain the code itself. So methods always start with an open curly bracket and finish with a closed curly bracket. And like I say, all of the bits of code go inside. So let's write some code to actually do something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the void update method and these two annotations in green because we're not going to use them right now. We may as well not have code in there that we're not going to use. So let's declare a variable. Now, when declaring a variable, it doesn't matter whether you have the word public or not at the beginning. I like to have public because I like to see my variables within the inspector panel within the Unity engine, but we'll see that as we get further on anyway. So firstly, let's go public, and then we need to declare the type of variable. So let's start with just a simple game object. And a game object can refer to absolutely any object that is in the hierarchy inside the Unity engine. Now this is where we call it something, whatever we want. So we're going to call this the axe. And now we finish the line with a semicolon. Why do we do that? It's a way of the script realizing that that is the end of the line. There is no further code after that semicolon. So therefore we can then move to the next line of code. Speaking of the next line of code, let's have a different variable. Let's have a float. So public float. Now you'll probably notice at this point, things have started highlighting differently. Generally, you can see if you hover over why they're highlighted, they mean different things. But as long as they're not underlined like this right here, then it's generally good. You've done the right thing. So what is a float exactly? A float is a decimal number. It's not a whole number, but it can be a whole number. So a float can be one, it can be 1.2, it could be 1.3, it could be 1.4, or any number really. So I'm going to call this my number, semicolon. You've probably noticed at this point, 
why some things are capitalized and some aren't. Well, that's just the way the script is used and just the way Unity recognizes, or rather the code is actually used like this. If we were to have this as lowercase g, this wouldn't work. It has to be an uppercase g. So just keep an eye on your capitalization when scripting, it is important. So next, let's have an integer. What is an integer? We can define that by int. An integer is a whole number and it cannot be a decimal number. It can only ever be a whole number. Like I said, a float can be a decimal, but it also can be a whole number. But an integer, only a whole number. So let's have this called my integer and a semicolon because we've ended that line. And next, let's have one more variable and let's have this a true or false possibility. So this variable can only have two outcomes, a true or false, and that is known as a bool. So public and let's have bool, lowercase b, and let's just call this true or false, and then semicolon, because we've ended it right there. Now let's create a few lines of code to see how these scripts work nicely. So within this void star method, let's make the axe appear on screen. So I'm gonna go back to Unity, and I'm gonna click this axe, and I'm gonna turn it off. So when we press play, this axe won't appear, but we're going to have this script make it appear as if by magic. And to do that, we can use something real simple. And if you're using uh, Visual Studio, you'll be able to see that it's kind of predicting what you're going to do and it makes things a lot easier. So if we type the axe, because that's the one we want to deal with, you can see here, it's given you what it thinks you're trying to do, which yeah, that's fine. Next, we need to have dot because we need to do the next action. And the next action is going to be to set active. So if we type set active, you'll see it's done it right there. And we can just have it do that nice and simple. Now, the next thing we have to do is inside the curly bracket, sorry, not curly brackets, the normal brackets, the parentheses. And we can either give a true or false. And you'll see the little note here is giving saying a bool value. Remember, bool is true or false. So we can either set this as true or false within these brackets. And what should we do? Let's have it set active as true, simply because it's off and we want to turn it on. So close bracket and semicolon. Remember, that is the end of that line of code. So we can move on to the next line. At this point, let's set that float to a random number. So my uh, number, equals, and let's make it equal to 1.7, because why not? Now you'll notice at this point, we can't have 1.7 semicolon because it still underlines, it says it's wrong. In C sharp, we always have to put an F after any decimal number, so as it recognizes that it is a decimal number. It's just one of the little quirks that you eventually get used to. So don't worry if it confuses you right now. You just have to remember that, yep, that's all there is to it. Next, let's set the integer to six. So my uh, integer, and you'll see it's already predicted it for us, equals six semicolon. It's as simple as that. And finally, let's set our bool as true. I think by default, it's probably going to be false, but we'll see. So true or false, you can see it's right there. So we can hit return on that. And we'll put equals true semicolon and then save the script. So hold control, press S, or go to file and save. So what now? Well, let's head back into Unity. We've written the script, but how do we actually apply this script to this scene? It can be done very, very easily. I'm going to go to game object and click on create empty, just create an empty game object. Now this script can be attached to this game object nice and easy. And you'll see over here, we now have this as a component within the object and we can see the four variables that we created. That's why we use the word public. So we can physically see them right here. So the ax says non game object, my number and my integer right there. And the true or false is dictated by a tick box or a blank box. So what we can do now, the ax, we need to define this ax right there. Just a case of dragging and dropping from the hierarchy that object over here, and there we go. So when we press play now, the ax will appear. My number will go to 1.7. 
my integer will change to 6 and this will become ticked because that's what we've told the game to do in our script. There we go. And the axe is right there. Simple as that. So that is the basics of how you can actually code in Unity and building small like this and building up from that really makes the difference. Don't try and start building massive scripts if you've got absolutely no experience with coding whatsoever. Start small like this. Build your way up. Have that goal. There'll be more coding tutorials on my channel. There's literally hundreds of tutorials that I have with coding on there and I recommend checking them out because you could learn something new, something you didn't know previously. We're going to learn how we can solve errors using the console for C-sharp coding. So in this scene that I have, I've kind of modified the script that we created in the last tutorial of this little series. And if we click on console, we can see these errors right here. Best thing to do when you start off is just quickly click clear, just to make sure you get rid of anything which isn't a persistent error. And we can see here this first error that is given us is within this script, which is in assets, scripts, JV script, 10, 10, and it's given us an error code and what it's expecting. So we can see here, this is the script and we have a couple of different things wrong. If you can already see the errors that we have here, because there is one, two, uh, three, four errors. So if you can see all four now, you're a great coder. So what we can do is if we double click this right here, it will take us to the line of code or rather where it thinks it's falling over. So you can see here it's highlighted this line of code. The reason being is it's having trouble executing this line of code. You can see here 10, that's the line. And we can see here, this is why it's referring to 10. It's referring to line number 10 right there. And it's like I say, having trouble executing this line of code. So we need to look at this line of code itself. We can't see anything wrong with it. So then we backtrack to the line previous and we can see here that there is an error. It's highlighting the little red there. So what's missing here? What is missing? It's just a semicolon. So if we place a semicolon, resave, head back to Unity, it will recompile the script quickly and it will give us this error as well. So we can see here, this error is saying line 20. And once again, we can double click and it will take us to where it thinks there's an error. And it thinks that's an error. Realistically, yes, it is an error. Although it's a just closed curly bracket, there is nothing it's actually relating to. That's why it's underlining. So this closed curly bracket relates to this open one, so them two relate. You click on it, it will highlight. Same with this one. This one closes the class. This one opens it. So this one has no real purpose. So we can delete it and save. Head back to Unity where it will quickly recompile. And it'll say, yes, we have another error. This one, a little bit longer, but we can see that line 14 is where we need to deal with it. So rather than double click, we could just go to line 14. Again, we can see here, it actually tells us what the problem is. So rather than fix it itself, it tells you what you need to do. So you can see here, a literal of type double cannot, implicit, uh, cannot be implicitly converted to type float. Add suffix F to create a literal of this type. So if we double click, it will take us to that line of code. And all we could see, I said it in the last little tutorial we did, we just need to put that F in there. There we go, done. So let's save that script, as simple as that. Head back to Unity, it will compile, and we have nothing. The console is now clear. So when you have errors in your game, the console is your best friend. It will tell you more than you actually realize because double clicking, like I showed you, will take you to roughly where the error is. It'll either take you to the line where there is an error or it will take you to a line of code it's having trouble executing, mainly because of that line or the previous line itself. So never be afraid to use the console and you probably will create errors as you code. It's just something that happens, you know, if you have a massive code, you get confused and whatnot, then... It's just one of those things. Now, one thing to be careful of here as well, if I press play, the code itself won't actually do anything because there is one last little thing that we have done wrong. So if we click on here, you can see this little component says there's something wrong. It's not appeared in the console. However, if something doesn't work in game, always try looking at your inspector panel 
where the script is. Now, usually this error is something simple, which I did discuss last time. So notice that we have JV script as the script name. However, the class is called JV scripts with the S at the end. So that's the reason why the script isn't working. It doesn't give any errors. It doesn't have a problem with the game, but that is an error in itself. So you just need to be mindful. That is why calling the class name is vital to the same as the script name. So if we get rid of that S, resave, head back into Unity, we may need to reapply the script. Oh, no, it's already done. It's all right, we don't need to reapply it, but there we go. It's refreshed itself, it's recompiled. Press play, and the script now works. So they are the different ways that you can check for errors and how to fix them in Unity, but definitely always use the console because the console will give you more information than you could ever want. So guys, I hope that helps with fixing errors within your c -sharp coding. Hey guys, Jimmy Vegas here, and let's take a look at some UI. So UI is also referred to as GUI or HUD, HUD. It could be either of these things, any of those things, but it's all the same thing. So what is it exactly? Well, if we go to game object and then go down here to UI and let's select the first one in the list, text. It will create two extra game objects as well, one being the canvas and one being an event system. The event system doesn't really matter too much because you can pretty much create an entire game without ever even touching the event system, but it's something that you can get into in more advanced tutorials. Let's take a look at the canvas first off. What is the canvas? Well, it is a way of actually containing all of these UI elements. And if we double click the canvas, we can see it's dictated by this white box here. Everything inside of it is visible on the screen. Anything outside of it will not be visible on the screen at all. So to put that into perspective, let's take this text here. Now let's change this text to say, this is my text and let's select the rec tool to make it uh, a little bit bigger maybe so we could bring it like that uh, let's make the font size let's say i don't know 30 and font you could change the font if you want to font uh, style you could change to bold if you wanted to italic whatever uh, you've obviously got the usual alignments uh, the wrap and you know if you wanted to overflow whatever and you've also got the color so generally text is as you would normally expect to change things. So we can see this is our text. However, if we press play now, we won't see it on our screen. We just see this. Hmm, fair enough. So how do we get this on the screen? Well, we can see here we have this little icon here, and this is called an anchor. We can select certain positions on the screen that we would want items to appear. So we've got top left, top center, top right, uh, middle left, center, middle right, you know, you've got all them. You've also got the stretch ones here. Something like text won't really matter too much, but let's have this set as the bottom right. It won't change here, but we do need to change everything within the transform. So if we select zero and zero, it will disappear from this screen right here. However, double click and we can see it right there. We can then use that rec tool to kind of move it into position, let's say about there. And you can see as I'm doing that, there is a blue line across the screen going upwards. That is telling us that we are dead center of where we need to be in the screen. So if we press play now, we should see this is my text in the bottom center of our screen. There we are. Excellent. That's what I'm happy to see. So it's not just text that you can do that with. Let's go to game object, let's go to UI, and let's try a raw image. Now a raw image, we can attach a texture to it. Now we did say a couple of tutorials ago within this short series that textures aren't applied directly to game objects. In the case of a raw image, that is the one exception because it doesn't actually need to be a material. You can attach a material, but you may as well just attach texture. And there you go. So let's set this anchoring to, I don't know, top right. Let's set zero, zero, and let's double click on that raw image and we can just move it into position there. And if we press play now, that should appear at the top as well as this is my text. So all aspects of UI are pretty much the same. There's not too much difference between them. They all work the same kind of way. If we select something like a button, 
we have the button created. Let's have this center already set. So zero, zero. And if we press play, there we go. The button is right there for us in the middle of the screen. So remember, this canvas overlays whatever we see on top. So if we were to turn the canvas off, all of the UI elements would disappear. Back on, they all reappear. A UI element can only exist within the canvas like this, as we see it now. If we were to move the text out of the canvas, it would disappear. Back in, it would reappear. So remember, something like this has to be inside the canvas. So it's up to you what kind of UI elements you want to create. But never be afraid to kind of work with things. Something like a panel, if you press play, you can see here that the panel will cover the entire screen. It literally does look like a panel. However, we can no longer click that button. The reason being is that the order of the canvas, all this UI, is dictated by its order within the hierarchy. So if we bring the panel to the top, then press play, we can see that everything that we have now can be used. So this is clearer because it's not behind the panel. And this button is clickable because it's also not behind the panel. You just have to keep that in mind. Finally, you can also create different effects with using UI. For example, if we go to UI and go to raw image, we could select stretch right here and then zero out everything in the transform and let's change it to black. And we would literally have a complete black screen. And remember what I said about the order of things? If we change the order, we would have that button on top. Simple. So like I said, UI is remembering the order of things, what it can be used for, and different ways you can do it. You can even animate things. You can even animate this black raw image to be a fade screen if you wanted to. So understanding UI can be difficult, but you just have to kind of persevere with it and experiment and see what kind of things you can create. So you can create weird effects at times with UI. For example, if I turn off that raw image, go to our text and press play, I'm going to rotate the text on the x-axis and you can see it looks like it's actually shrinking. Now that's a strange effect that you can have but in reality if we go to our scene view and take a look here we can see that it's not actually shrinking it's actually rotating. So that is an effect that you can create simply with UI. So guys, I hope that's helped a little bit with how UI works, how you can create it and what you can do with it. If you want to know any more please leave a comment below and we're going to take a look at how we can change a script within a different object than the one it's attached to. So linking objects and linking code. It's a cool process that can be used specifically for saving and altering things throughout the game world and throughout different scenes. So let me quickly turn the canvas off so we can get a clear view of what we are doing here. Now, I want to go onto this cube right here, and this is basically our ground. And we have that script that we uh, had attached to the scene a couple of tutorials ago, which brings up that axe and whatnot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach another script to another object. And to do that, I want to create another script. So how do we do that exactly? Well, let's go to our scripts folder and let's right click and create another C sharp script. And let's just call this linked code. Now the idea of linking is all done via one little word at certain points within the code and that's the word static. So I'm going to delete that and delete this and just have void update. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have public and then have the word static and then we'll have this as an integer so int and we'll just call this something simple like uh, linked number semicolon. And one thing I always like to do when dealing with static is have the same variable but without the word static. And I'll explain why in just a second. So if we type public int and then just have internal number semicolon, they are going to be the same number and we can make them the same by going to the void update method and typing internal number equals linked number semicolon and let's save that script. 
So let's attach that script to a game object within our scene. So I'm going to create another game object. So empty. And I'm going to just right click and rename and call this linked. And then I'm going to attach that script onto it. Now, it's worth noting at this point that we only have one variable visible. That's the reason why we have that internal variable. So having the word static makes it disappear from here. It's still there. It's still accessible. It just isn't visible here. But we still want to see what it is. So that's why I have that right there. So going back to our JV script, what we can do is if we click here, change. Now, we're going to use this script to do something else as well. And to do that, I'm going to have another method. I'm going to have void update. Open close bracket. Doesn't need to be private. That's fine. Generally, I like to have things as they are. We don't need the word private for void update. It's fine as it is. And all we're going to do here is we're going to reference that script. So we're going to link to that script to change a variable within that. So we can type linked code and you can see it's predicted it. And then the variable name, so dot. And then remember what the variable name was. It was linked number. It has to be the static one. So linked number equals and then we'll make it equal to my integer so my integer semicolon and save so now if we head back to unity not a lot is going to happen as we see it however when we press play this linked code script should change its number to six so let's check that out there we go so we've just linked one code from one object to another piece of code on another object. And it all works real time. So if we go to our game object right here, if we change the integer to, let's say, 74, and then go back to our link script, you'll see it's linked already. It links it every frame. That's what update is for. It will update every frame to make sure that link is right there. And this kind of thing can be so useful in game development. It may not be useful in minor game development, but when you create a massive game, creating those static variables to link different things is absolutely necessary. And we can see here, this is amazing how it can work. It's, it, it's literally instant. And just to prove a point, let's put it as zero, linked back to zero. So guys, that is how you can link code with game objects using the word static. It's a little word, but it's so important. So I hope that's helped a little bit, gives you some ideas on what you can do within your code. And let's try and understand time and time scale within Unity. So what is time scale? Well, Unity runs real time and that number that it runs at is classed as one. So real time in Unity is defined as one. Therefore, double time in Unity is defined as two, Half time in Unity is defined as 0.5. We can manipulate time scale if we want to, but it has different effects on the game depending on what you do. Also, time scale of 0 means that Unity is frozen. However, not everything will freeze in Unity, it just depends if you reference time scale within your game. So let's put this to the test. I'm going to create a C -sharp script just to rotate this little green cube right here. So I'm going to call it rotate. And all I'm going to do is in void update, I'm just going to have a transform dot rotate. And in brackets, I'm going to have this as uh, zero. So rotate zero on the X comma one. So I'm going to rotate it on the Y axis comma zero comma space dot world. Now it's a very simple script. It's literally just that one line of code inside the void update method. So I'm going to save that script and then attach it to this object. Simple as that. Now, when we press play, this will rotate just normally. So keep in mind, it's rotating based on the current time scale of one within Unity. Now, this may shock you a little bit what happens at this point, but we'll soon see.
So if we right click and we create another script, C sharp script, and let's have this as change time. Now, what we can do here is change Unity itself. Now, I'm going to get rid of this again, but I'm going to have a variable. I'm going to have it as a float. So public float, and we'll have unity time scale. And I'm going to make it equal to one by default and semicolon. Now what we can do is time dot time scale equals unity time scale semicolon and save so what's going to happen at this point well when this script runs it will automatically set the time scale as one and one is the default anyway so we're not going to experience any difference whatsoever however when we do change it things will happen but like i said not everything will have an effect so firstly let's attach that script to a game object so we have it in the scene so change time on there and now we have the ability to change it right here so let's press play now this is live linked to the unity time scale if we were to press zero nothing is going to happen do you know why i'm hoping you guys do or at least some of you may have cottoned on of course we know why so it doesn't matter at this point, whatever the unity time scale is, whether it's one, two, three, four, zero, doesn't matter. This cube and its rotation are not linked to the time scale. So if we go to the rotate, what we would need to do is have whatever the number is here multiplied by time dot time scale and save. So now we're understanding how we can use time scale to proactively change what's happening in Unity. So pressing play, once again, we won't have any change. The cube will rotate. However, if we change this to zero, it will stop. That is because the time scale in Unity is frozen. It's, it's literally frozen. If we change it to 0.1, it will run it at a tenth of what it normally would. So you can see here changing the time scale is relative to all objects which reference that time scale. So when using movement within Unity, if you ever need to pause the game, it's always vital to reference that time scale. I cannot stress enough how important time scale is, but remember I said earlier, one is default, two will be double. You can see how it changes. We can just get it looking crazy if we have 42 speed. So it's running currently, at 42 times normal real-time speed. And that's why it looks a little bit crazy. I guess you could use this for effects if you wanted to. Again, it's all down to time scale, how you can create these kind of effects. But this sort of thing, you could effectively create this and then slow an object right down. Obviously we're in minus speed there, but you can see what kind of effects you can have when dealing with time scale. So it's something that you should probably get used to, especially if you're trying to create a pause menu, because a pause menu would mean that the Unity time scale would be zero. And that is how you can manipulate it. So guys, if you want to know any more about controlling time within Unity and understanding the time scale, then please leave a comment below. Let's understand what colliders are for. So a collider is pretty much an object which is basically it stops it going through other objects. So if we take this green cube up here, for example, we can see if we zoom in, we actually have a green outline, a quite a prominent green outline underneath the orange selection outline. And this green outline is known as the collider. And that is a component right here. If we were to untick the box collider, the green line would remain, but it'd be a faint green line. And all this means is that if we had a character, for example, we'd be able to pass through this particular object. Now, if we re-enable the collider and tick is trigger, the same would occur. Now, a trigger on a collider basically means that we're able to kind of pass through it, but when we do pass through it, it activates a trigger, and that's where coding comes in. So it's just worth keeping in mind that a trigger is just that. So the collider can come in many different forms, and if we click on add component, 
and go to physics, we could add a mesh collider, we could add a capsule collider. Generally, it's worth noting that adding a mesh collider and ticking convex may put extra strain on the game itself, simply because the mesh collider will try and attach one face of a collider, which is basically that right there. It will try and attach one face of a collider to every try that is within your object. And what is a try exactly? Well, if we go to our axe right here and zoom in. Now, originally, this is several objects kind of pieced together, but the object itself has a different shape than just a normal cube. So, for example, if we go to add component, go to um, physics down here and click on mesh collider and then tick convex, you can see just how this is changing, how it looks. You can see there's many, many different ways of having a collider on there. It's doing it all different kind of ways. Now, that is unpractical with such an object like this. There is no point to it. So you may as well remove it and add just a simple box collider. It gives the exact same effect, just less work for Unity to do. And as I said, there are different types of colliders that you can have. And just depending on what type of object it is, you would have all of those colliders. So colliders are also used for physics as well. And physics are kind of important within Unity, but that's something for another tutorial. So whether you're working with a simple object like a cube, or whether you're working with a more complex object like this axe, for example, you would have to determine what kind of um, collider you would want to go for rather than just sticking with a box or rather just sticking with a mesh collider. It's definitely worth looking into which one is going to be the most proactive for your game. So colliders, they are a lot simpler than what people think. And if you want to know any more, guys, please leave a comment below and let's understand rigid body and physics. So last tutorial, we spoke a little bit about how physics and uh, colliders can all mix together to do different things. If we take a look at this scene we have right here, we just have this floating box. That's not really real, is it? You'd expect it to fall down. And this is where rigid body comes into play. So if we take that cube right here, click on add component, click physics, and then click on rigid body, it will basically give it real time gravity, a little bit of physics going on. So you have your obvious settings here, you know, your mass, gravity, whatever. And this kind of thing is by default is pretty decent. It will serve its purpose. When you get into deep development, like really advanced stuff, then this stuff is probably going to be really refined for you. It would take the time to actually change these things and make sure everything is right. But to kind of get the basics down now is all we really need. Now we've applied this rigid body and if we press play, this will just kind of fall and plonk on the floor. Great. That's exactly what we'd expect it to do. However, if we were, let's say, to change this on the Z, it won't just fall and just kind of stick as it is. It will write itself as you would expect it to do with physics. So it won't just land like that. It'll correct itself like that. And that's where the rigid body comes into play. And the rigid body can be attached with pretty much anything, but it works well with a collider. If we were to turn that collider off and press play, even though we've got the rigid body, it would just fall through the floor because there is nothing for it to collide with. Even though gravity is attached to it, there's still nothing for it to collide with. So that collider does need to be on. So let's take a look at what else we can actually do here. If we go to game object, 3D object and create a sphere, let's try and keep this as real as we would expect. I'm now going to delete the cube and then just attach that material onto here and let's attach that uh, rigid body. So this is going to look a little bit unreal, to be honest. It's going to look fake because it just kind of plonks on the floor. It looks like a ball. It looks like it should bounce. So although we've actually got the rigid body attached and we actually have got some physics going on, this is where the rigid body and the collider kind of work together because what we can do is select a specific material. So let's select bouncy. And you can get this uh, bouncy physics material from the old, um, what are they called? Standard assets. You can get them from that on the asset store, or you can create your own or, you know, find them somewhere else. So all it would be basically be a case of is 
we've attached even more physics to this object now. And if we press play, because the collider has this, it should bounce, as we would expect to see. So it gives it just a little bit more realism. But you have to be careful about something like this, because if we set this to two, it's going to look a little bit silly, because it'll bounce. And it's not 100% realistic there, is it? Because it's supposed to lose a little bit of mass as it comes down, but it's not really. So you need to just keep an eye. We've set it to one, but either way, having it higher than probably about 0 0.5 is a little bit silly because it would give less realism. And a lot of people in games want to go for realism. But either way, that is how the uh, rigid body and the box collider will all play a part in creating physics for you. So guys, I hope that helps a little bit more with physics and rigid body because there is a lot more to it. But once you have the basics down and understand why these things happen, then you can probably learn a lot more on your own. And we're going to understand how to use coroutines and what they are in C Sharp coding. So firstly, let's actually create a new script because Coroutines are absolutely important when you want to deal with waiting and time and space within Unity, and they are, well, widely used. So let's just call this script2, because why not? So within Visual Studio, we have to initially create that coroutine. So what I would like a coroutine to do is basically wait for, let's say, 10 seconds and then we can do something. The reason we can't do that in a normal method here is it, it just doesn't like it, basically. It has to be a coroutine. And the coroutine is always started by I enumerator. And we can call this anything we want, literally anything we want. So let's call it ball code, because we're going to deal with that bouncing ball that we had from the last tutorial. And then open close bracket, so you got your parentheses and open curly bracket and hit return. So initially it will underline in red. Reason being is because it's expecting to kind of wait at some point or yield as it were. So why don't we do that first off? Yield, and then we want to return a new, and then we tell it what we want to do. So wait for seconds. And then in brackets, the amount of time we want to wait for. So let's say 10 seconds. Close bracket, semicolon. So after 10 seconds, what do we want to do? Because this does work in the same way as a method. We just have more options available to us. For example, if, if we take this line of code here, put it in void start, it wouldn't actually work. See, already you can see it doesn't like that. So that method wouldn't work. So that's why we do need the I enumerator. So after, let's say, 10 seconds, we want that ball to just disappear. So what we can do is let's set it as a variable. And variables work the same way. In uh, coroutines, you can still call a variable. So public game object. And let's have this called the ball. Semicolon. So much like we would in a, me in a normal method, the ball dot set active false semicolon so let's say after another i don't know three seconds the ball reappears so we can copy and paste that line of code again and let's change it to three seconds and let's have the ball dot set active and let's say true obviously because we want it back so using coroutines gives you the ability to kind of create a sequence of events. So here we're creating that sequence of where we're waiting 10 seconds, turning it off, waiting three, turning it back on. So how do we get this coroutine to start? Because if we attach this to our scene now, this coroutine won't even begin. So I'm going to get rid of void update and do this in void start. If you're just instantly calling a coroutine, you would do it in void start, not void update. Reason being is because you wouldn't want this coroutine to be called every single frame. You want it to be called just once, and that's it. And we can do it by typing start coroutine, and in brackets, type the name of it. So ball code in this case, 
open close bracket, close bracket again, and semicolon, and save the script. So here, all we're doing is when the game starts, we're instantly calling this coroutine and running this sequence. So let's attach that to a game object, script2. Let's attach it onto there. And we just need to attach it here, sphere over there. So now when we press play, it should play as normal for 10 seconds, and then it will turn itself off. So let's just see the sequence in action. There we go. Three seconds, comes back on. And there we go. So that has created the sequence of events. And I guess we could do that even more because we could go a little bit further into this coroutine and type while. And let's say um, bounces ball is less than 10. Then we do the following. So we can do that. Now it's under bounces ball there because we haven't set it. So that means public int bounces ball semicolon. And what we can do in this is this will loop inside the coroutine until it meets this condition. So what we can do is come here and then we say yield return new wait for seconds and in brackets let's have 0.5 f f because it's a float remember semicolon and then after half a second we could use that line of code turn it off then we can copy that line of code and then this one here to turn it back on and then obviously the final thing to do within something like a while loop is to increase this because we want this to happen 10 times so we would have bounces ball plus equals one semicolon so what that would do is add one to whatever the value of bounces ball is and save so this coroutine is going to run through it quite nicely now so let's go back press play and let's see this entire routine play out so we should have this for uh, 10 seconds and then it should turn off or set inactive as it were and there we go and now on for three seconds and there we go you can see there we go so it's doing that whole 10 thing right there 9 10 and there we go that coroutine has stopped and it carries on as normal so guys that is how you can use routine or coroutines i should say within unity Remember, they are important for when you want to control something like time. It's not just wait for seconds that you can do. You can do a lot of other things as well. But whenever you're dealing with waiting, you would need to use a coroutine. And remember, starting the coroutine is done as simply as that. So let's finally take a look at those player settings. So if we go to edit and go down to project settings and click on player, we get, as you would expect, the play settings. Now, these are not the actual player, as in your third person controller, your first person controller. These are not the settings for that. When it says player, it actually means the kind of package that it's playing. So for example, it's the executable file on a PC and it will be the mobile APK file for Android, whatever. So these play settings refer to the actual device mechanism not the player in the game so obviously you would have your company name right here your product name so for example company name would be jv unity and product name would be how to use unity you'd have your icon and cursor if you require it generally when i do it i'm not really someone who uses the cursor but i obviously do have an icon these options here this one is for pc this one is for ipad iphone whatever and this one is for android each of these will reflect every possible platform so if you set something here then you would obviously have it further down the line however you can override if by just clicking that basically whatever you have as your default icon will be placed all the way down here unless you want to manually override everything here is pretty self-explanatory there's nothing drastically uh, confusing or anything like that but you would choose your resolution right here so you can set everything what you would need to do uh, generally default settings are pretty decent 
Splash image is actually the image which refers to the executable file when we start up Unity, not the splash screen that you would have perhaps your company name displayed on. It's just the image on a little box when you build your game. Uh, things like other settings and XR, which is basically VR. Uh, so you've got Mac App Store options right there, because don't forget this is for PC standalone. Not entirely sure why it would ask for Mac there, because there is a little thing with uh, Mac devices. You can't build it unless you're on a Mac, but that doesn't mean to say that you know you can't just take this as it is over onto Mac. So that probably explains why that is there. XR is basically VR support, as you would expect. Uh, obviously, going across to uh, Apple devices, you can see everything is pretty much the same, nice and easy. Again, it's all self-explanatory. And finally, uh, if we go to um, Android, you also have the options of creating, you know, whatever else you can have your ads added in this way. But ads is something, you know, for another time because that's not really basic Unity stuff. But either way, what I would recommend doing is once you have the basics in, things like your name, uh, game name, icon, splash image, check your resolution, make sure everything's all right portrait, landscape, whatever. So, you know, you can obviously rotate if you want to, but if your game isn't rotationable, you can turn it off here. So obviously the last thing and I'm gonna mention in this section is the publishing settings. This is where you have to create the, uh, basically the key. So you're able to publish it on Google Play. Now there are a lot of other settings that you can deal with, something like graphics and quality. The quality settings is something I'm going to quickly explain as well, because this is how you can set how much quality is available in your game. For example, you can have very low, low, medium, high. These are all the default ones, but you can actually customize and create your own just by changing these settings here. Again, by default, Unity does them pretty well. So you don't really need to modify these too much unless you want to change your name here and there. But the main thing you'll be dealing with or rather the last thing you should probably be dealing with when you're creating your game is that player settings. Because most of the time you're just creating, once you're done, you can set everything right here. And when you build your final product, it will be related to everything that you have right here. So guys, I hope that's been helpful. I hope this entire series has been helpful. Uh, I have plenty more tutorials on the channel, so hit subscribe, click the bell icon. You can stay up to date with everything. And there is hundreds and hundreds of different things and more advanced things for you to learn on my channel. And if you've enjoyed this short two hour series and feel like supporting a good cause, please feel free to check out my Patreon where you'll get things like early access, exclusive content, free project files, and much, much more. And with that guys, Thank you very much for sticking with me for the past two hours. See you around.